Now, because some of you guys are doing quoted repairs, I want to address something else quickly. Um, when you are charging a system, say you put in a compressor. Anybody here ever put in a compressor before? Mm -hmm. Okay. When you put in a compressor, you pull a vacuum on it, you're ready to charge it. Where do you put the refrigerant? What's that? Going to the suction. Yeah, most, I found, just found out that a lot of people are at Kalos. Um, the reason why we get in the habit of putting it in the suction is because when the system's running, that's the only place you can put it, right? Like you don't have a choice. But when the system's running, again, you're always doing it in liquid nowadays because of the blended refrigerants, you have to be just slowly feeding it in, right? Because you don't want to flood back the compressor. When you're putting refrigerant in a system that's off, you put it in the liquid line. Because if you put it in the suction line, what are you doing? You're dumping a bunch of refrigerant all at once, right? It's a ton of liquid, and it's just going to sit there right at the inlet of the compressor. As soon as you fire it up, and some of it will go in the shell. As soon as you fire it up, what's going to happen? It's going to flood. And it's going to, mostly what it's going to do is it's going to foam the oil, and it's going to just run oil all throughout the system. Um, and now it's going to take a while for that oil to make it back. And is it going to ruin the compressor all at once? Well, no, you're not going to know. But the problem is, is that the, if the first couple hours of its life it's running <coughs> on lubricated, it's really going to hurt its life. It's like it's like uh, getting a brand new car and running it without oil for a couple hours and then putting oil in. Um, not without oil, but let's say short on oil for a couple hours and then putting oil in. That, that engine's not necessarily going to seize tomorrow, but now it might seize at 50,000 miles or have a major problem at 50,000 miles when it would have gone 200,000. Right? And that's kind of an important thing. Um, the next thing that I want to mention is um, crankcase heaters. Uh, if you run into, if you're doing compressors and it has a crankcase heater in it, you need to make sure that the crankcase heater is working. And you know that a lot of cases we replace contactors when we put in new compressors. Mm -hmm. Okay, If you replace a single pole contactor where the crankcase heater is designed for that single pole contactor, and you replace it with a two-pole contactor and wire it the same way, the crankcase heater won't work. Okay, now I'm gonna just show you real quickly what you're looking for. If you look in the wiring diagram, you're gonna see something that looks like this. You got a single pole contactor. That's what a contactor looks like in a wiring diagram, right? Have you ever seen that before? Okay, you're gonna notice if a crankcase heater is wired like this, and it'll usually be something like this, and it'll say CCH. You see, that's not, you know, like most things that we wire, we wire one side to the top, the other side to the top, or one side to the bottom, other side to the bottom. Mm -hmm. When do crankcase heaters, when are they supposed to run? When do they, when do they operate? Do they operate when the compressor's running or when the compressor's not running? Running. Actually, when it's not running. Because if it's running, the compressor's already hot. All the crankcase heater is doing, I mean, it's right in the name. All it's doing is heating the crankcase, right? When a compressor's running, Crankcase is already going to be warm. So what a crankcase heater's purpose is, is to keep the compressor warm so that refrigerant doesn't condense in the compressor. If refrigerant condenses in the compressor, you get flooded start. You get that same effect of putting liquid refrigerant in the suction line. Liquid refrigerant goes and just sits in there, turns into, or just gathers in the bottom of the compressor when it's off for a while. Then when it starts up, boom, it, start, it boils immediately and it just throws the oil all out of the compressor. Does that make sense? Now, this, because again, if this switch is closed, this is very basic electrical stuff, but just hang with me here. If this switch is closed, what is the voltage between here and here? Zero. Zero, right? So when the switch is closed, this crankcase heater ain't gonna run. If the switch is open, what is the voltage between here and here? You think it was 120, but it's actually 240. And the reason is, is because this pole is still in place. Mm -hmm. So it's actually feeding back through the windings of the compressor and everything else. And that's why this works, hmm. is that not only is it energizing the crankcase heater, not only is the crankcase heater a heater, but it's actually using the compressor windings as a heater as well. Hmm. But because you have this crankcase heater in circuit, it's increasing the resistance, electrical resistance, to the point that it's just a very minor heater. Like, so it's actually using the windings it themselves to keep that compressor warm. So you can take a live amp draw off of that mm -hmm. one. It's awesome. Yep, when the switch is open. Now, if you take this and you put in a two-pole contactor, no, it's now no, it's it does nothing. No. 
It's not even, not even 120 because there's no path back, right? There's nowhere for it to go. So if I measure from here to here across this open switch, I'm not gonna measure anything because it's not going anywhere on the other side, right? There's no, there's no complete path. And so now I just took this crankcase heater and made it into a nothing. Mm -hmm. Now, what could I do? I could take it and wire it like this, disconnect it from here and wire it down here. The problem with that is Concert. now it's going to be all the time, even when the compressor is running. Now, if it has a thermal switch, which most of them do, um, then the thermal switch is gonna shut it on and off, right? So then that's okay. But what else is the problem? Now it's not going to use the winding of the compressor the way it was designed to. It'll probably work, but it's not going to work right. So what's the solution? Pretty easy. Two things. The first is, so for now, if you all you have on your truck is a two-pole contactor, what you do is you just take a number 10 wire and you connect it from here to here. Now you just made that you just bypass that leg and now it's gonna operate like a single pole contactor. Do I like that? No, because it's stupid. They make single pole contactors. The cool thing is, is that the Sure switch, which is the contactor that Copeland makes that has, it's a, it's an electronic contactor. It lasts way longer. It has brownout protection. It has a lot of other nice things in it that help protect the compressor. Um, it's, it is a single pole contactor and it's a single pole 40 amp contactor. That's the reason why we use two pole contactors is because we can get them in 40 amps really standardly. They're inexpensive. They work really well. They last a long time. That's why we've always done that. They also have the nicer lugs on them. If you've ever noticed the ones that are just, just nicer. Um, so we're probably going to go to whenever we have compressors and we're going to swap them, send the sure switch with it. Now the downside to that is, is you got to pay attention because they don't look the same. They're not hard to wire. They're not that complicated, but they just don't look like a normal contactor. Instead of, being like this, they're kind of like square format, and the terminals are all down here at the bottom like that. And so you have to pay attention to what the terminals are. That's basically it. Um, but then at that point, you don't have to worry about it. You just wire it up properly, and now it's, it's a single pole, it works fine. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Cool. Other than that, obviously you know patience and setting charge. When you're doing things like replacing parts, you always reconfirm the original diagnosis. You always do a good solid visual inspection and you're going to do the full measure quick profile because you want to try to see what caused the problem. Another thing to mention, always use your scale to weigh in refrigerant, always use your scale to weigh out refrigerant, right? Always. Not only so you don't overfill the tank, that's one reason, but that's not even the biggest reason. Say you went to install a compressor and you, you, start, you start weighing out the refrigerant and you only take three pounds out of a four ton system. Mm. Well, what do you do? Exactly. Yeah, you stop and do not proceed with that compressor until you found the leak. And don't even if you don't find the leak, you don't just move on, right? Because the reason that compressor died is probably because it was short on charge and it overheated to death, right? So you always have to think about like, you know, you go to a system and it's got a totally plugged evaporator coil. Uh, and you got a bad compressor, do you just swap that compressor? No, nope. oh, you gotta make sure that evaporator coil gets clean. Well, what if it's 12 years old? Okay, now you're gonna pull and clean the evaporator coil, you're probably gonna end up with a leaky evaporator coil, and then you're gonna, like, you have to think this stuff through, because the customer might be frustrated by a conversation at that point, but they're gonna be a lot less frustrated than if they just spent 2,000 plus dollars, uh, or whatever, and it happens again. Right? And so you want to be proactive. Not that we're trying to scare anybody, we just want people to get good results. That's all. We don't want them to throw good money after bad. Awesome. Make sense? Yes, cool. So again, it's just that holistic thinking, understanding the why, paying attention. And for things like compressors, evap coils, TXVs, reverse <coughs> valves, these are expensive repairs. Uh, we want to try to address everything else that could happen with that equipment while we're there. Thanks for watching. If you're willing, give this video a thumbs up and drop us a comment. Don't forget to hit that bell icon to stay updated with all of our future videos. And as a quick reminder, HVAC School isn't just a YouTube channel. Dive deeper with us at our main website, hvacrschool.com. Curious for more knowledge on the go? We've got you covered. Tune into the HVAC School podcast, available on all your favorite podcast apps. And while you're at it, join our thriving Facebook group. Also, don't miss out on our free mobile applications, available for both iPhone and Android. We're all about community, Vortex by Tex.